This is the Louis T. Network. Detroit, I told Detroit, get you one before you don't get you none. And they listened, they took my advice. It was a struggle. This was an old-fashioned NFC North shootout. Nobody wanted to win this game. This looked like a two and three ball club versus an 0 and five ball club. Both of these teams did their best to try to lose this football game, but only one team could lose, unfortunately. And so let's jump into this quickly. Chicago. A bad interception. This was the old J. I don't know this J anymore. I'm, I'm, I like the new J better. This is the old J. That interception in the end zone of Rasheem Mathis, who is an alien, by the way. What is he, 96 years old? The one position you're not allowed to play when you're really old is cornerback. Young, young, those young whippersnappers come in the league and they run a circle. He's still playing at a high level. Picks off Jay Cullen in. Bad, bad decision, bad throw, bad mistake, Jay. No, 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 no. Can't do that. Never trust a man with two first names. He's bad. Welcome back, Alshon Jeffrey, to the party. He made his grand entrance in this game, and he was huge. That's why you never, ever trust a man with two first names. They're dangerous. Don't trust them. They'll get you like he got the Bears, like he got the Lions in this game. Bears, too conservative for me down the stretch. You're a two and three ball club. You're looking to get back to 500. Time to be aggressive. That's never been who John Fox has been throughout his career. He's never been an aggressive head coach, so it doesn't surprise me. But you got nothing to lose here. You're, you're two and three, you're looking to scratch and claw back and win your third consecutive game. You got a chance to put this game on ice. Lions are on the ropes. You get a first down, this game's over. They're, they're running out of timeouts. And a first down here puts the game away. You run it three times, they stop you, they get the football back, they drive down the field and get a touchdown and take the lead. And you help them, okay? You help them with a senseless personal foul penalty after they got a dumb uh, intentional grounding penalty that had them third and goal from the 21 yard line. He just incompleted the pass. He was going to be fourth and goal from the 21 yard line. And you get a personal foul penalty roughing the passer. Gives them a fresh set of downs, 10 yards closer to the end zone. And they get a, a touchdown to Calvin Johnson on the next play. You deserve that. But in your defense, Beautiful drive to tie the game and send it to overtime. Cutler just went bing, bang, boom, field goal. It was it looked really easy, I, I swear. But then again, it's an 0-5 Lions team. No confidence. They knew the Bears were going to drive down. The, the question was, are they going to get a touchdown, not a field goal? Had they had five more seconds, the Bears get in the end zone and win this game. Just that they ran out of time, couldn't afford to try to go for the end zone and run out of time and not get the field goal. They did the right thing and kicked the field goal, send it to overtime. You go to the Lions side of things, Amir Abdullah continues to fumble. At some point, you're gonna have to take this young man off the field. He's on kickoffs right now, you, you gave him, and I like the confidence you instilled by putting him back in the lineup and giving him touches. He's dangerous though. And not to the other team, to your team. He's dangerous because he is liable to fumble on any given touch. Two more fumbles, if I'm not mistaken, in this game, this guy's got, he's got a tight end. Golden Tate, his touchdown further convolutes this touchdown rule. What the hell are we doing here, folks? How does this thing work? What's a touchdown when you see, the thing is cr that's crazy, last week, Devontae Freeman catches the football, takes two steps, stretches it over the end zone line, gets knocked out of his hands as he's stretching, should have been a fumble, they, uh, really should have been a touchdown, he had already crossed the, the goal line. They say that's incomplete. Nope, that's not a catch. Okay, fine, whatever. 
Golden Tate doesn't even have a football for four tenths of a second. He gets hit, ball goes in the air, Bears pick it off. You want to call it a fumble, you want to call it a whatever. Should have been Bears ball. They call that a touchdown. What are we doing here, folks? You got some explaining. You got some explaining to do, NFL. Figure it out. Make this rule cut and dry. Okay, we're taking points off the board. We're putting points on the board, okay? Now we're talking points. There's one thing when we're talking about some rules that impact the game from 20 to 20. We're talking about points. Points wins and loses ball games. You can't play with people when you're talking touchdowns. You talking about touchdowns, you better fix this goddamn rule. I know that much. Lions with two unacceptable, inexcusable mock punts. Again, they did not want to win this game, okay? They didn't want to win this game. They tried their hardest to lose this game. And that, those led to Bears points, okay? So 10 points to be exact. Can't do that. Can't do that. Stafford interception in the fourth quarter leads to a touchdown and the Bears two point conversion to give the Bears a 31 to 24 lead. More mistakes from a team that can't afford mistakes. The Lions wanted to lose this ball. Beautiful fake field goal though, and look, when you're 0-5, don't sit on any surprises. Pull all the stops out and say, look, man, if we going down, we going down. Guns are blazing, I'm empty in the clip. Whatever I got, I gotta get this one. Cause I told you, if you can't beat the Bears at the crib, I don't know what to say to you, partner. <laughs> so, hey, I think Jim understood that and he said, hey, we gotta get this one. Pulls out the fake field goal, it works. They end up getting a field goal out of that uh, possession to cut the lead to 31 to 27. And then you get the touchdown late. How long is the Megatron with a huge catch in the end zone? And then he was being Megatron in overtime. That's what I want to see. I don't understand why that doesn't happen two or three times a game. You're going to get one on one coverage with him at some point in the game. And if I see it, I'm going to identify it and I'm going to tell him, hey, just go deep. I'm going to throw it up. Hey, sometimes even double coverage, I would do that with that guy. Just throw it up. Let, let him go up and make a play. He's Matt Mammals for Megatron. Let him be Megatron. Whatever. They got the win, 37-34 in overtime, get their first win of the season. No more winless teams in the National Football League. Probably the earliest we've been able to say that in the last five or seven years. I can't recall the year where there have been no winless teams past week six. So that's a good thing. Lions get their first win. They're off the schneid. Bears, all your momentum comes to a complete ah! stop with this loss to the Lions. You're now 2-4 the season. Baltimore at San Francisco, one and four Baltimore, one and four San Francisco. Break this one down quickly because somebody had to win this game, right? Baltimore, offense out of sync. Early, Flacco a little off, okay? The, the interception flew with the pressure on him in the second half. Uh, no, you can't do that, Joe. You know better than that. You know better than that, Joe. You know better. Okay, and he was off in this game. Smith in the end zone, ball was slightly behind him. Steve couldn't pull it in. That's normally a catch Steve Smith makes, but ball he hasn't, hasn't played in a couple of weeks, hasn't practiced a lot. You throw it behind him, time is a little off. Can't happen, but that's, a, that's on Joe. Joe's gotta make a better throw. He was open in the end zone, should have hit him. And that interception. Steve Smith still the best thing you got in Baltimore. That's the problem. That's a huge problem. Because he's 30, what, 6, 37, 38, and this is his last year, and you don't have anything else. And I know Bashad Perriman hasn't played. I'm not counting on that guy. I don't even know that dude. You don't know that dude. So don't talk to me about him. There's not enough stuff in Baltimore right now. Steve's your best thing you got smoking on this offense. That's a problem. Red zone woes continue for the Ravens. Too many times he had to set up for field goals. Joe was off, like I said. There were opportunities to score touchdowns. He missed. Loud defenders that were beating on plays to get back into plays and break up flat passes. Uh, I, this Ravens team is just so frustrating because they're in ball games with chances to win and we're used to them pulling it out and they just don't. They're not doing that right now. Terrible interception by Flacco to start the second half. That's the one I alluded to earlier that led to a field goal in a 19-6 deficit. This team isn't good enough to dig themselves 13-point deficits and think they're gonna come back and win the football game, especially on the road. And so, Joe can't do those type of things. Kenneth Acker picks him off, gets a really good return, sets them up for a field goal. If you're helping out a team that struggles to score themselves, you can't do that if you're the Ravens and you want to win. For the San Francisco 49ers, Cap, with an excellent start to the game. 10 to 13 for 203 yards and a touchdown. 
kind of continuing off of what he did against the Giants the week prior. Uh, Ravens don't get pressure on the quarterback, so uh, they have to dial it up. If they're gonna get pressure, they gotta dial it up. But when you dial up pressure, you leave guys exposed one-on-one, -on -one, Cap was able to take advantage of that with Torrey Smith having that one-on-one -on -one coverage with the guy that they just got off the street from the 49ers who released him earlier in the week. They take advantage and they go right after him. Torrey Smith with a 76-yard touchdown grab. Uh, Anquan Bolden went off in this game. He turned the clock back, had another 100 and some change on his Ravens team. I just thought they did a lot of good things on the offensive side. They got Bruce Miller involved, which is always good for the 49ers because I think he needs to be a bigger part of the offense. He's a mismatch. He gets on the field, he makes things happen. So they did a lot of good things early in this game. I thought they really struggled late. I thought they kind of went conservative after they got the 13 point lead. I thought they tried to take the air out of the ball, kind of start playing the clock and stop playing the Ravens. Almost allowed the Ravens to come back and steal this game from them. But that was a good defensive stop for them inside the five yard line. Ravens had the football first and goal from the three yard line. Could not get in, had to settle for a field goal right before the half. So. Again, this defense shows signs of life. There's still some really big, glaring issues on this defense, but they show signs of life in just about every ball game. Cap still doesn't break down information fast enough. He doesn't process information fast enough. I'll give you an example, and we'll move on. Ravens in an all-out blitz. They're in the red zone, and he's got man-to-man -man all across the board. And either you need to send a signal to one of your receivers to break off a route or you need to do something. But you you can't have a situation where you know they're coming. They're coming, they have they're they they have not disguised anything. They're coming on this play. They're telling you, hey, we're coming after you. And for you to not find someone to throw the football to, and really on a number of plays, Cap is looking to get out of there. Even a touchdown to a Patton. He's looking to get out of there. He, he runs this way, they cut it off, he comes back and he looks around and he sees Patton. Defender falls down on the plate, pads wide open, he hits him. Cap is looking to get out of the back door. He's got to hang in there and he's got to start making plays as a passer from his brain. He's not doing that yet, but hey, he did enough to win this game. 25 to 20. Ravens tried to put a charge into him late. They gave it a run. They're just not good enough. They're, that's not what this year's team is about. Maybe last year, year before last, they come back in this game 27 25. On a joke fly goal to Torrey Smith. You know, late game touchdown. That's not what this team is about this year. That's they just can't do that. They don't have the capacity to do that. They lose 25 to 20. 49ers get their second win of the season and snap their four game losing streak. Big game in Seattle. Carolina Panthers, the undefeated 4-0 Carolina Panthers taking on the two and three Seattle Seahawks. They need this one bad. And hey, just a team you want to see, a team that you've owned over the last three years, 4-0 versus this Carolina Panthers team. Russell Wilson has done a great job of beating Cam Newton. And so if you're the Seahawks, you don't feel all that bad about the 4-0 Panthers coming to town. Well, maybe you should. Let's jump into this one. Slow start for Carolina on the offensive side of football in this game. Three false start penalties. They had an interception by Cam. They fall behind 20-7. Didn't look good early, I'm not gonna lie to you. Not gonna lie to you, didn't look good early. But that's the makeup of a team that has been there, done that. And let me tell you what really helped you in this game. That playoff ass whooping you took to the 49ers a couple years back, and you were really good. They came into your house, stomped a mud hole in you. Remember that game? How the intensity level was too much for you to handle. Guys was losing their brains, getting into scuffles and picking up personal foul penalties, and you didn't know how to conduct yourself. Remember that? That game prepared you for a game like today. The Seahawks were juiced. You had a guy like Jimmy Graham getting in the face of defenders and starting stuff. I saw Jay Nutso get in his face. Headbutt him, could have been a penalty. But you kept your cool because they were trying to lure you into the trap. They fed you the bait, but you didn't take it. And that's what you needed to do. You've been down before. You've been in situations like this before. You're a battle-tested team. That's why those battles take place so that when you're in those positions later on down the line, you can go back to the experiences that you had before. You can play off of those and play good football and get done. That's what this team did in this game. It was huge. Jay Stewart, gosh, he's a man. You needed a grown man back in this game. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't get away with a tiptoe specialist. No tiptoe burglars in this game. You needed to have a grown man back. They were hitting in this game, okay? They were hitting this game and Jay Stu was bouncing off of dudes, 
running the football aggressively. You needed that in this game and you got that. And that was big for you in this ball game. Grego! What more can I say about Grego, man? God damn it. I, I, I talk about Grego because you know going into the game, you gotta stop. It's just like the Patriots with Gronkowski. You gotta stop Gronkowski. Don't let him beat you. And it's even more so with the Panthers because at least the Patriots got Edelman and Amendola and some other stuff. The, the Panthers, you look at them and you're like, hey man, if Teddy Ballgame wants to go off, go ahead, do it. If old man Jericho wants to get me, go right ahead. All right, Bunches, he's still trying to learn how to catch in this league. Don't let Greg O beat you. And that's what they did. That's a credit though to the Carolina Panthers, to Cam Newton for still looking for this guy even though the defense should be trying to take him away. And more importantly, to Greg O. Greg O! I asked Greg O in the offseason when he lost KB, I said, hey man, <laughs> uh, that's a big big loss, man. That's tough. Uh, you think you're going to be able to do more? They're going to need you to step up, partner. I don't know if you can step up more than you did last year. You led the team in catches last year, tied for the most yards receiving with 1,004, 1,008, something like that. Can you do that again? He's like, <laughs> Hey man, I don't have a choice. They need me. I gotta step up. I'm like, but Greg, you can't step up any more than you did last year. He said, hey, we're gonna find out together. And to see him do the things that he's done this year, already in this young season, just tells me, man, he's a pro's pro, man. Greg O gets it done. Whenever Cam needs him, he's there for him. And I, I talk about this all the time. Cam Newton only knows one speed, man, when it comes to throwing the football, and that's fastball. 101 mile an hour fastball. His changeup is 99, okay? Greg O doesn't drop the football. I mean, you throw it in his direction, and he's gonna catch the football. He gets open, he wins one-on-one -on -one matchups. He's as reliable as reliable gets in this league, and you needed him in this game, and he came up huge against the Seattle Seahawks on the road. But the reason you won this game, three drives of 80 yards in this game. The Panthers simply were able to wear this Seattle Seahawks defense down all day long. And to me, and I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me, but the biggest of those 80 yard drives that you had in the game was the first of which you had when you went 11 plays, 80 yards, you were down 20 to seven. Ricardo Lockett had just caught that big double pass for a touchdown, the crowd is raucous. You're on the brink of getting your brains bashed in in this game. You can barely hear yourself think, and you managed to put together an 11 play, 80 yard touchdown drive capped off by a J. Stu touchdown run and I'm telling you right now without that possession there is no final possession ninth career game winning drive for Cam and that doesn't happen without that 11 play 80 yard and that was clutch that drive was simply masterful is what it was and that's the sign of a team that's been there done that before this team this Panthers team mentally tough takes a mentally tough team on the road against that defense the way the game had been going up until that point to go down the field and get that drive, silence the crowd, get back in the ball game and give yourself a chance. And that's what that drive did and that's why that was the most important drive of the game to me. The team speed on defense for this team is <laughs> awesome. It's ridiculous, awesome sauce. I mean, the teams that make Russell Wilson struggle are the teams with defensive team speed. And when you've got it along the defensive line, the linebackers can run, he's not able to escape the pocket and make things happen. That's why he was able to eat the Lions up and they were able to win that game. He was out there playing backyard football and the Lions couldn't do much about it. Now they did sack him in that game, they forced him to fumble, but he made plays in that game that helped them win that football game. In this game, the Panthers won't have and you can run, but you can't hide from teams with that kind of team speed defensively. They're, even their deep tackles are scary. k on short, KK was a problem in this game. They've got stuff everywhere. The young kid, Ryan Dallaire, he's a problem. Coney Ealy, I, I, there was one play, Russell Wilson gets outside the pocket. He had been breaking contain all first half. That second half, they were like, uh-uh, man. You're going to have to go somewhere else with that. We didn't learn our lesson. We're not breaking contain anymore. You're not breaking contain anymore. We're not going to crash inside, let you get outside and escape the pocket. And he tries to put a little move on Coney. Coney Ealy said, hey, man, stop. 
No, seriously, stop. <laughs> Put them down on the ground. And that's what this Panthers defense can do to you, man. It's just so many athletes on the field at one time, hard to deal with when you're a quarterback that uses his athleticism and your offensive line not giving you time forces you to have to use that athleticism. And it's good to see that Panthers defense keep him in check, especially in the second half. Cam's ninth game winning drive was impressive to say the least. They went right down the field. They did not blink. There were some third downs. There were some crucial plays picked up. Had Tank again with a big catch. Jericho Cox's catch may have been the biggest catch of the game. Because if you don't get that, that's going to bring up a fourth down. You got to have it always. I don't even know how he got the football in there. I don't even know how old man Jericho came down with it. But after Greg O, he's the most, the next most uh, reliable target on your football team. And if I'm Cam and I don't see Greg O open, that's who I'm looking to next. And that's who he looked to on arguably the biggest play of the game. He went to Jericho Cotry. And again, not a bad option to go to. I love me some Jericho Cotry. Very underrated in this league. That was a great drive. And there was a huge breakdown on that final play, but doesn't matter. That's not your problem. Cam identified it and he's starting to grow too and come of age. He made some mistakes in this game, but again, mentally tough enough to battle through the mistakes and come through the other side of that unscathed and win a W. Big time win. We'll come back to the Panthers in a second. Let's go to the Seahawks in this game. Jimmy Graham was huge. Jimmy Graham. He's a man. They don't use him enough. I've, I've already chronicled this. I'm not going to beat on this anymore. I've been harping about this all year long. It seems like it's a game. Every other game is where this guy's uh, uh, effective. He was uh, effective in game one, nine and two. He was in three, nine and four. He wasn't in five either. Now he's back in game six. So it's just so erratic and sporadic for this guy in this offense. They just need to figure out that he's the best player they have on the offensive side of football after Marshawn Lynch and get him the football. And, and they need to figure that out. And when, the sooner they do, the better they will be as a football team on the offensive side. Uh, fast start defensively. I thought they came out and looked like the Legion of Boom. And they haven't looked like that a lot this season. They really um, struggled. And, and I think Cam Chancellor missed in the first few weeks. Hurt. And then he comes back not really in sync with everybody. And then you lose w Wagner in this game or last week, and he wasn't able to play this week, and that impacts your team. We saw how you struggled last year when Bobby Wagner was hurt. You struggled in this game late without Bobby Wagner, but I thought you actually got off to a really good start defensively uh, without him in this game, and it, it just, it, they, they wore you down defensively because your offense didn't do enough in the second half. Hell of a play by Ricardo Lockett on the touchdown to go up, take the football, from the safety, that's a, a thing of beauty right there. And um, again, there's not really much you can do if you're the Panthers. You got a defender in a great spot. Need him to make a play on the football. Ricardo Lockett goes, hey, give me that. You don't know what to do with that shorty. Let me get that from you. And uh, that's a big play. And, and they, they pulled out all the stops. They went to the, the bag of tricks, got something out, and, and it actually worked. So uh, kudos to them for getting that done. Too many mistakes and breakdowns late in this ball game. Um, you got penalties, and, and nothing. No penalty was bigger than the, the holding penalty, and I, on Marshawn Lynch. And I really think that was Russell Wilson's fault because if you look at the play, there was actually a lane for Russell to step up in the pocket. But in his mind, the line isn't going to protect me, so I just need to go ahead and escape out of the back door. So he spins instead of him just stepping up. Marshawn was blocking as if Russ was going to step up, and instead Russ decided he wanted to spin, pivot, and turn outside. Well, now I'm blocking for you to step up. You go to the outside, which is where I was blocking. So he gave him a little tug, official saw it through the flag. And that was huge because they were going to be able to potentially run the clock out with a good drive. They had already picked up a first down with a Jimmy Graham completion out to about the 40. That holding penalty made it like first or second and 20. And then just went backwards from there. Gave the Panthers the football. Not only back the football with plenty of time, but also in great field position because those penalties and those lost yardage and then Russell Wilson takes a sack on that possession. It all amounted to bad punting position and great field position on the other end for the Panthers for that uh, game winning drive. So there was a lot that went wrong on that uh, final possession for the Seahawks and late in the ball game in general. And, and of course the defensive breakdown that we saw not being able to get the stop. The Seahawks that we've come to know and love over the last three years, they get stops in situations like this. They win the football game at the end. They haven't been doing that this year. They should have lost to Detroit at the end. They lose to Cincinnati, blowing a 17 point lead. They lose this game. They were up nine. I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna say. When it was 14 to 23, I don't know about you, probably Panthers fans can identify with me here. At 14 to 23, with seven minutes left in the game, 
I'm thinking, damn, they got it. And, and man, maybe you thought you had a shot, you know, 14, 23, but the way the game had gone and the flow and the rhythm of the game, uh, I didn't think you guys were gonna win the game. I'm not gonna lie to you. Uh, 14 to 23, they had the momentum. They had been dominant all game long. And I thought nine points was gonna be too much to overcome in a seven minute period because you hadn't done much of anything all game long. And to ask you to score 10 points when you've only scored 14 and over, you know, 50 minutes in the game, it's hard to see you doing that, but that's exactly what you were able to do. So this is a big come from behind win. The inability to run the football down the stretch, along with the inability of Seattle to sustain drives and keep that defense off. See, I thought that defense was tired and gassed at the end of the football game. And the Panthers, I talked about three 80 yard drives, two of those coming in the late stages of the football game. This defense was tired and the offense didn't do enough to help them out and the inability to run the football Consistently this offensive line not being good enough. It's gonna hurt this Seahawks team and they may not make the postseason this year And I've said that and I've talked about the Seahawks. I've talked about the Panthers on the podcast If you haven't had a chance to check that out, please do Louis T Network uh, Dot com or on iTunes on Stitcher all that information down in the show notes below but I've talked about this team and their inability to close the show and one of those reasons they can't run the football this is not the same Seahawks that we've come to know and love that team is gone and I don't know if they're coming back in time enough to save the season but the Cardinals are for real the Rams aren't afraid of you anymore and the 49ers are right around the same area you are <laughs> they're trying to find themselves and they got a, a whole new situation going on and you got to play them at their place on Thursday night. Somebody's going to drop to two and five in the season. Hope it's not you, but you're going to have to play a lot better football than you've played over the last three weeks if you expect to get a W on the road against a 49ers team that's starting to figure some things out. So that'll be interesting, but that, that last breakdown is pretty much indicative of where this team is right now. They're lost. They really don't have a clue. We saw that last week against Cincinnati. We saw it again this week against the Carolina Panthers in the waning moments when you needed to stop, you couldn't get it, and you lose the football game. 27 to 23. Big win for the Panthers. I think these are the type of wins that show the growth and maturation that this team has, has went through, the transformation process that's taking place. Cam is starting to grow up right before our very eyes. In, in past years, they would have lost this football game. Every game against Seattle was close, but the Panthers never could do enough to win at the end. This time, they were able to get the job done, and you're seeing this team grow right before your very eyes. Am I sold on this Panthers team at 5-0? I'm sold on the fact that they're better than I thought they were going into the season. I thought this was a 9-17, 10-6 if they were on their best behavior. This, is a better, this team is better than 10-6, and six, or excuse me, 9-7. They're, they're probably going to finish the season 10-6. They're probably going to finish the season 12-4, and 11-5. And, and they very well may win this NFC South Division. I didn't think they were going to win. I thought the Falcons, and I still think the Falcons are the best team in that division. But I'm going to tell you right now, the way the Panthers are, are playing and they're looking, this is a dangerous team. And the defense, to me, is going to be the key because I'm still not sold on this defense being as good quite yet, okay? I still think there's some uh, holes and some deficiencies in this defense. I think there are some places you can exploit this defense, but if they can, if they can start getting more pass rush, I'm still not quite satisfied with the amount of pass rush, even though I like this Delaire kid. I'm not quite sold on the pass rush yet. If they can get more pressure on the quarterback, look out for the Carolina Panthers this year as one of the best teams in the NFC. We'll see, but this is a huge win. You had some demons to exercise, man. You really needed this one. You got this one, and it probably made it that much sweeter that it was in Seattle, and you finally conquered that demon of the Seattle Seahawks. That's, that's a big win. You move on to the next game, San Diego at Green Bay. San Diego Superchargers. You move on to that matchup. Start with the Chargers. Melvin Gordon, two fumbles in this game. He ended up getting injured and not finishing the game. Also had a big run. It's funny, I'm hearing a lot of people talk about him and compare him to Trent Richardson. Why are we doing this? It's early. I don't think he's looked that bad. Has he been great? No, but I talk about this all the time. NFL players, much like life, and I think I say this all the time, sports is a really direct parallel to life, to microcosm of life. And people mature you know, at a different rate in life. You know, a 16-year-old might have the, the brain capacity 
and the demeanor of a 35 year old and they act way mature beyond their years. Then you've got 35 year olds that act like they're 16 and they're ready to fight and they're going out to the clubs and they're drinking and they don't have any stability to their life and they're, yet they're almost 40 years old. And that's how it is in life. And that's how it is in the National Football League. You got some guys that get in the league and day one they get it. Like Todd Gurley looks like he gets it already. He's a beast, he's a stud. The Rams can count on him, they can hand it to him 30 times and the kid probably will get you 150, 200 yards. I don't think that Gordon is there yet and that offensive line for the Chargers isn't there yet. So, look, get off of his back is basically what I'm trying to say to you. No, he didn't have a great game. No, he hasn't had a great start to his career, but get off of his back. KA13 is ridiculous, okay? I, I mean, he is literally ridiculous. Jordan Jackson action pack guns ridiculous. I'm talking about that kind of ridiculous. Keenan Allen is a stud, and he continues to show that this year. When he's not catching two or three passes, he's catching 15 or 16 passes. He had 14 catches in this game for 157 yards with seven minutes left in the third quarter when he got injured. He was on pace for like 20 something. He might have smashed that record that T.O. said a decade ago, where he broke Jerry Rice's record for most catches in, in a single game. He was well on his way to doing that. And Phillip Rivers was looking for him. And the Packers could not stop him. He was on a crash course to break that record. And he got in. And you should have seen some of these catches in this game. Ridiculous. This guy is ridiculous. Underrated. Doesn't get enough respect. Keen Allen, one of the better receivers in this league. Fields is an OG, man. <laughs> Fields is an OG. You know what OG stands for? You can make OG stand for whatever you want. But this OG in particular stands for original gunsling. All right? This man was out there throwing the peel, and he really, you want to be honest, he out Aaron Rodgers in this game. Now, they didn't ask Aaron Rodgers to throw it 59 times or how many times. He threw it 65 times in this game, did Phil. 65 times. 43 of 65 for 503. Yes, 503 yards. The man was balling. No picks. None. Wow. Touchdowns, no interceptions, and it still wasn't enough. God damn it, boy. Those Packers at home, boy, tricky, tricky, tricky. All of those yards, and it still wasn't enough. But damn, Fields is an OG, boy. He is an OG. There's not many of those left. Not many OGs left in this league. <laughs> but Phillip Rivers is one of them, man. Ball been called by Mike McCoy right before halftime. I thought he was going to go conservative on me and, and settle for the field goal. He elected to go for the touchdown. He called a timeout and he thought to himself, what am I doing here? This is Aaron Rodgers. This is the Green Bay Packers. This is us on the road. We're not going to win by kicking field goals. We're going to win by scoring touchdowns. He elects to roll the dice. And when you got an OG at quarterback, you can do this. And Phil calmly drops back off his back foot, lobs it to the corner of the end zone, finds Dontrell Emmett for a one-yard touchdown to send this uh, San Diego Chargers team knotted up at 10 or at the halftime break, or excuse me, down 17 to 10 at the halftime break. So that was a big play. You kick a field goal there, you're down 17 to 6 at halftime. I don't think this ball game is as close as it ended up being, but because you scored that touchdown, you put confidence in your football team. That I believe in you guys, and you can go out and get it done. They did, and now it's 17 to 10. You cut that lead in half, and now you got a shot going into the second half of this ball game. I thought the defense hung tough against A-Rod and company. There were some injuries that the Packers had. I don't care about that. That, that. That's of no concern to you. You go out and get it done, and that's what you did. You gave your team a chance. And that's what this Chargers defense has done all season long. You did it against Cincinnati. You did it last week against the Steelers. You did it again this week. You've given your football team a chance. Now, have you always won those games? No. But you've given your team a chance for the most part, and that's all you can ask for as a football team. We move on to the Packers, and it's when A-Rod's hard count it's dumb, okay? It's stupid good. I mean, every week I'm seeing guys jump, and it's like, you know, going into the game, don't do it. Don't jump. He's gonna try to draw you off sides, and if he does, he's gonna go for a free play. His intellect, his football IQ is off the charts. He's another one of these guys, like a Peyton Manning, like a Tom Brady. They'll try to get you on the field with 12 men, and if you do, you're not gonna get that 12th guy off the field. You're gonna get a penalty. That happened in this game, too. He's just one of those guys that his hard count is ridiculous, is what it is. It's dumb. It's what it is. It's really, it's cheating almost. James Starks was a spark in this game. 10 carries, 112 yards and a touch. 
had a big like 55, 60 yard run for a touchdown. He was huge. His first carry of the game was like 35, 40 yards. I mean, James Starks was phenomenal in this football game. Fast start by the Packers. I thought this one was gonna get ugly quick. It was 17 to three before you blinked. And I said, oh man, and San Diego walked into an ish storm. That's what they did. They went out to Green Bay, kind of lamenting over the loss on Monday night, short week. And uh, they walked into an ish storm. And no, they kind of, they held it together, made it a ball game, but it looked like it was gonna get ugly early. Fast start by the Packers in this football game. Remember when James Jones couldn't catch? Remember that? No, like he didn't drop any damn thing. He did have a drop in this game, but back shoulder fade for a touchdown. A-Rod is looking for this guy, and when you're missing Jordy Nelson and some of your other targets that you rely on, this is a guy that you remember and, and you trust, and he's getting the football to him. He's catching everything, it seems like. Another good game for James Jones as a Packer. The youngins put in work in this game. It's always good to see the youngins get in and have an impact. And I think Demarius Randall has had an impact all season long. We saw Quentin Rollins have a huge impact last week. And Demarius Randall, game-saving play, had another breakup in this game that was huge to stop a touchdown. I thought he was tremendous in this game. Then you got Jeff Janis. I've been talking about Jeff Janis for about two years now. And I've been waiting for this guy to get his opportunity. He's been waiting patiently. He gets an opportunity. And he has two huge grabs in this game. One sliding catch by the sidelines for about 60 yards. Another on a shovel, improvised play by A-Rod to pick up another 40 yards or so. This guy was magnificent in this game. And he's an excellent special teams player. Love Jeff Jennings. Did you see the wheels on that kid? I knew he could run, but it's another thing when you see a guy actually open up on that shovel pass, man, he was motor. I said, damn, look at Jeff Jennings right, man. Love it. I love it. That, I love seeing the youngins get involved. Big drive by the pack at the end of the game to get that field goal to make it a, a seven point lead to give them a chance to win with the touchdown. Puts you in a position where the Chargers know they can't win this game in regulation. They only can tie it. Just changes the whole mindset of the team. I thought it was a huge drive to extend it out to a seven point lead and basically secure victory even though Phillip Rivers, that OG, went all the way down, got his team in a position to tie the game, but they just missed out. Great play by Demarius Randall, the rookie, to save. The day Packers again find a way to get it done at Lambeau, 27 to 20, remain undefeated on the season at 6 and 0. It's just been tough for the Chargers, man. They're two and four. They don't deserve to be two and four, but that's what they are. They played a rough schedule. This team is better than two and four, and you're going to see a lot more of this Chargers team before it's all said and done. Sunday night football, New England Patriots, Indianapolis Colts game was a lot closer than I expected, but I did say in my breakdown. Um, in my pick show that I thought that this game could be a lot better. I thought the Colts would show up and try to raise a little cane and, and, and give the Patriots a run for their money. But at the end of the day, Tom Brady owns Andrew Luck and the Colts just aren't good enough right now. There's too much going on in Indy. I said that they're going to make the playoffs because there's nobody in that division to challenge them. But this team isn't really a playoff caliber team. If they were in any other division, in football, this team wouldn't be making the postseason, but because they play in the worst division in football, the Colts are gonna win that division and get a home playoff game. But I thought they actually played well in this game. Well enough to win, no, not against an elite team, but good enough to compete and make this game close, and that's what they did. New England, clean response to the Indy opening touchdown drive. Edelman gets the touchdown, messes his finger up, and he, he had some problems after that, catching the football but uh, they went right back down the field after uh, Andy opened up the game with a beautiful touchdown drive to start. Patriots respond with a touchdown drive over there. I said, is this is how it's gonna be all night? Is this what we're gonna do all night? Because if it is, I'll just go, go ahead and go to the fridge, give me some refreshments and sit back, kick my feet up and enjoy this uh, shootout because it didn't look like there's gonna be a lot of defense early in this ball game. Edelman hurts his finger, as I just said, on that touchdown and struggles to catch afterwards. And, and, and because of that, Brady throws a pick six that really was on Edelman. Good throw, should have been caught. Edelman doesn't want to put the uh, hand at risk. Pops the ball in the air. Next thing you know, Mike Adams there, Johnny on the spot, picks it off and he's had great success versus Brady. They documented that on Sunday night and he gets a pick six and all of a sudden, Colts are right here in the ball game, but they have a problem with the Indianapolis Colts. His name is LeGarrett Blunt. They don't know how to stop him. Playoffs, regular season, Steelers jersey, Patriots jersey, it really doesn't matter. If LeGarrette Blunt is around, they have a problem, and he did it to him again. Had a nice, long 32-yard rushing touchdown. Had a receiving touchdown to put this game out of reach in the, in the late stages of the ball game. They have a LeGarrette Blunt problem. 
And so it rears ugly head in this game again. Patriots get it done. You go to Indy quickly. Indy aggressive early in this ball game, going for it on fourth and goal from the two yard line. Dante Moncrief pays it off with the uh, touchdown catch. I thought they needed to be aggressive. You've seen a, a team that was desperate for a win against a team they struggled with. They pulled out all the stops. Went for it on fourth down right there. You had a fake uh, punt, which we'll talk about <laughs> a little bit later on. They did a number of things that uh, you generally don't see from a team unless they're desperate, and this is a desperate football team. Gore ran the football well. I thought early in this game, I thought they had some holes and they were able to exploit the Patriots defense. Good to see Ahmad Bradshaw back in Indy. Don't know how effective he's going to be for this team, but he's a heart and soul type of guy. Good to see him back on that sideline. Andrew Luck rebounds after failed onside kick. That's another thing that they tried because, again, and they were in the ball game. There was really no need for it, but when you know that the other team is better than you and you struggle, you try things that you don't normally try, and that onside kick was another message that clearly was delivered that, hey, you're better than us, so we got to pull out all the stops in order to try to win this game. It didn't work, and so uh, it backfired. Patriots ended up scoring some points off of that, but Andrew Luck rebounded, took his team down the field on an improvised uh, touchdown pass to T.Y. Hilton, and it gives them a 21-17 lead. They tried dumb fake punt, and it's one of the worst you'll ever see. They split nine guys out. It's just the center and uh, one guy underneath the center who takes the snap, and, and again, I don't think this was intended on being snapped. I just think he was looking to cause confusion, mass hysteria. He was hoping that Bill Belichick would panic, call a timeout. Maybe they would do something dumb, like not put enough guys up there. Maybe only put one guy over the center and, and they would be able to maybe hike it and run or something. I don't know what the hell he was intending on happening, but I assure you, with three Patriot defenders there, hiking the ball wasn't the, the thing to do. And I don't think uh, Chuck Pagano intended on them hiking the ball, but it happened. It was one of the worst fake punts or whatever the hell it was you'll ever see in the league that's going to go down as definitely one of the worst calls ever made in NFL history. It was, it's a terrible call. <laughs> you don't do that and it actually cost them some points. Patriots go down the field to get a touchdown. Again, when you're playing against a team that you struggle with, you can't do dumb stuff like that. And, and that just speaks to where this Colts team is right now, okay? They're not where they're supposed to be mentally. They're not in a good headspace right now. And they're struggling. And so, that happened, you lose the game 34 and 27. Patriots were up 14 late in the game. Colts get a touchdown to make it look close, but uh, this game had been decided with about mm, seven minutes left in the fourth quarter. It was 34 to 20. You knew where this game was going. Patriots stay undefeated at 5 0. Colts, like I said, they'll be fine. They're now 3 and 3 on the season. They'll be fine. They play in the AFC South. They're fine. You move on to the Monday night game Giants at the Eagles. This was a turnover fest. Seven turnovers between the two teams. Eagles with four turnovers on the game. Giants with three. I think the Giants turnovers were much more costly than the Eagles turnovers. And the Giants had some costly mistakes. One being a uh, personal foul penalty on Dontre Moore. Just not smart. He actually said after the game, I don't have a high football IQ. That's not a smart play. Oh, glad you know that, and that's one of the most important qualities of a football player. High football IQ, he didn't possess it on that play. They ended up scoring on that possession. That, those kind of plays hurt, and they were getting off the field. That would have been fourth down. Instead, it was a first down. They ended up scoring points off that possession. Those are the type of plays that lose you ball games. Bradford hits another deep ball, but other than that, he was pretty bad on the afternoon or night. Uh, three interceptions, and I already said, I don't think he's very good. Um, in this league or in this offense. I don't think he's made for a Chip Kelly offense. Maybe seven years ago when he was at Oklahoma, he was great in this type of offense. Same for DeMarco Murray. Thought he was good in this game, but he doesn't fit in this offense. I think it's a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. He's much better with a fullback in front of him going up the field, north and south, downhill, one cut and go up the field. They've got him running laterally, trying to find a hole, trying to look for cutbacks. It's not who he is. But anyway, 22 carries over 100 yards, scored a touchdown. It was enough in this game. Giants came out, first possession, went right down the field, made it look easy and thinking, okay, Eli and company not playing around, and they don't score another point the rest of the night. Eli throws a pick six. You had one, and, and really the game changed when Larry Donnell couldn't hold on to the football, let D'Amico Ryan muscle the football. Give me the goddamn football, man. Took the ball from him like he was a little kid. And that, to me, was the turning point in the game. The Eagles were never the same in the football game. Neither were the Giants. The Eagles played with a lot more confidence after that defensively. The Giants played with a lot less confidence the rest of the game offensively. 
after that play, then you get the Eli Manning pick six to Nolan Carroll. Game kind of went downhill from there for the, the, the Giants and Rashad. Uh, Jennings fumbles the football. It's just not a good night offensively for the Giants. And that's what you're going to get from the NFC East. You're going to be in last place one week, and then you're going to be in first place magically the next. That's this division. Giants have looked great the last three weeks, and they scored seven points. <laughs> Hell, they looked excellent on the first possession. Scored seven points, those for the rest of the night. Unbelievable. Eagles get it done, 27 7, dominate the, the Giants, and uh, otherwise, sloppy performance from the Eagles. I mean, you wouldn't think a team that turned it over four times would win by 20, but that's what kind of game it was. But like I said, that's the NFC East for you. Both teams leave this game at 3 and 3. And the Eagles who look left for dead after losing to the Redskins two weeks ago. There's plenty more where that came from. While you're here, subscribe to the channel. If you want more Louis T, be sure to follow me on Twitter at in the lab room or you can like the Facebook page at in the lab room that's in the lab room on Facebook and at in the lab room on Twitter don't forget subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so